everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. Check out our ever-growing list of affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Proceeds from purchases help to support our show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simon, Certified Veterinary Technician and Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston, Licensed Physical Therapist and Small Animal Physical Rehabilitationist. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Morning, Kathy. Morning, Chris. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy to introduce you to a friend and colleague that I have known since about 2014, I think. And his name is Fred Levy, and he is a pet photographer. Fred and I kind of met uniquely because when I owned my own freestanding pet rehabilitation business, I backed up, the building actually backed up to the commuter rail tracks, which I thought was going to be a real problem when I wanted to start a dog rehab business. But you know what? It's one of those things. You ignore the sound of the train, dogs don't pay attention to the sound of the train. But what was great is I had a big sign that said Flow Dog. And Fred, in his commute, noticed that sign and reached out to me and asked if he could come in and photograph some of the dogs that we were treating. And we forged a great relationship. He came in several times. He even gave me prints because my walls were rather barren at that time. And so we had uh, his prints all over the, the building and people often remarked about them and sought out his services and so forth. And so today I want Fred to tell his story, some of the unique challenges of photographing pets in general, maybe some tips for photographing your own dogs that he can share, and then some of the special projects that Fred has done, namely the Black Dogs Project that I want him to expound on. It's a really cool thing, and I want to delve deeply into that. You know, Chris, I'm I'm really glad you turned me on to Fred Levy and his photography. It's just, it's so beautiful. And I think I can speak for you too here, for they don't usually speak for you, but you and I always find beauty in the animals that are what we always call perfectly imperfect, in the three-legged dog and the dog with one eye and the dog in the wheelchair. And when I was reading about Fred as we we're getting ready for the show and looking at some of his pictures, uh, someone had said this about him, and I think it, it was a, a perfectly stated that Fred is capturing the beauty in the real underdog. And I think that that sums it up beautifully. Absolutely. That's fantastic, Kathy. So let's welcome Fred Levy to our show. Welcome, Fred. Hi, Chris and Kathy. Thanks so much for having me on your show. You bet. So what, just tell us about your story, because you haven't always been a photographer of pets or the underdog. So, so tell us how you got to this place, Fred. Sure. Um, well, my background's always been photography. I've been doing it since high school and when I grew up in California. Um, and then, so my, like everything I've ever done has always been around photography. And it wasn't until we adopted our dog, Toby, that which was like 2007, I ended up going around and just taking lots of pictures of Toby. And of course, you go to the dog park, you meet lots of dog people. As uh, being slightly socially shy, the, my best way of dealing with people is with a camera. So, you know, I bring my camera, I take pictures of Toby, I take pictures of the other dogs at the dog park. I found out that uh, it was just fascinating, like being around other people at the dog park, because the nice thing about a dog park is there is no sort of social norm of like everyone being sort of in that same sort of social class. The only thing that brought everybody together was because they had dogs. So you meet all kinds of people. And I thought that was really a great 
And um, I was still working full time in Boston as a as a computer tech at an art school. And then so I would go around and take lots of pictures of people and their dogs. And then I started doing some research and then found out there is this thing called pet photography. And as someone with a fine art background in photography, I had no idea there was a thing called pet photography. And I'm like, a light bulb went off. I'm like, hey, if that's like a thing, that's what I want to be doing. And so I just started focusing all of my attention on taking pictures of, of mostly dogs, but any animal I can get in front of the lens. So um, it's been a lot of fun. And I knew that at one point, it's like, I could just do this forever. And that's what I've been doing. And I, and I was able to uh, do it a lot and focus on it completely. And now I left that day job in Boston so that I could do two things. One, focus on my photography and focus on my family. So those are the two things that I get the, my most joy out of. So that's what I do. How hard is it to capture that moment with an animal, with their moving around and playing and, and you know, just being dogs? How difficult is that to capture? And is that what, what is different between the professional pet photographer versus an amateur photographer? I think one of the advantages of photographing other people's pets is they're not that interested in me unless I have like something that's exciting to them, a treat, a toy, something. But if the owner is there and they're interacting with the dog, then I can sort of be there and be in the right place at the right time to snap the, the shutter to get the shot that I really like. And it's not just one shot. You know, we take lots of photos and then we end up editing down to, you know, a top 20, 30, 40 photos um, out of, you know, if it's a location session, we could shoot a few hundred photos um, depending on the location and what we're doing and who's involved. The harder part is photographing your own dog. That's the hardest thing because they know you, they want to do stuff for you because they're your dog. It's like you want to, if you are interacting with your pet, they want you to do something. Um, so they come to you or, you know, they, they do something you didn't expect. Or if you get down to their level, they're like, okay, it's time for me. So that's a little harder. That's always my challenge. But I, I want to get down low because my dogs are little. And as soon as I do, that means I'm engaging in play. So they run right over and I'm like, oh, no. you know, stay exactly. back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the thing is like you got to figure out a way to get them to stay in a place that you can then make your composition so you can take your photograph and then, you know, share it to the world and say that you have the best dog in the world because it's true. It's true. <laughs> this, this whole piece of pet photography in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years has really it's not only taken off, but it's starting to get a whole subcategories of photography. So people are taking, you know, we just talked to Lauren Kennedy from the Tilly Project, and she does end of life pet photography. And people like to do their puppy pictures and their family pictures and their pet Christmas pictures. So not only is it taken off, Fred, but I think there's a whole subcategories of photography for your pets. Absolutely. Pets are, are the, the are family to many people. So I'm sure your listeners really feel like their pets are part of their family. The the lengths that people will go for their family, even the furry family, knows no bounds at this point. Um, so I think, yeah, when people are focusing, there are subcategories within the pet photography world where you can just focus on end of life or puppies or something. Um, I always tell my clients that there are three times to get great photos of your pets professionally. Uh, when you first get the pet, whether it's a puppy or, you know, you're adopting a dog, um, when they're in their prime of their life and when they're seniors. So if you have those three, you will have a com complete collection of really great photos that you'll always have that will always keep your pet top of mind years after they're gone. Because even though they are not all of our lives, we are all their lives. And uh, it's really important to us to have that memory. And I've had some regrets in the past where I knew I wanted to capture, you know, something unique that my pet did. And I just thought there would be time, right? Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next month. I'll do it mm -hmm. next year. And, you know, you just never know. And, you know, we've also talked, I know you mentioned to me, Fred, when we talked last week that you're doing more senior geriatric dogs these days. And when we talked to Lori Levine about pet grief, she mentioned how important it is to have rituals and things. 
And I've certainly had people in my life, former clients, friends, family, and they have created, you know, maybe a shrine or something like that. And so, you know, I think that's important. We want those quality photos. And I'd like you to expound a little bit about the difference. You know, how does one tell the difference between a professional photograph and, you know, our cell phones are, are with us all the time now and we're constantly taking, you know, dozens of pictures a day. But why is that professional session so important and how does that manifest in the photograph itself? That's a good question. The, there is like... It's great to be able to run around constantly taking photos of your pets, your family, whatever your your daily interests are. And you know, do you have that? The problem with with the digital side of it is it is transient in the same way that like it just gets lost in everything else. You know, if you think about a photo that you took 20 years ago, right? It still could be a digital picture, but it's probably lost to the ether of like a bad hard drive, an old computer that got replaced, something like that, right? So um, when you hire a professional who can actually make like professional quality prints for you and be able to make like really great keepsakes, whether it's a print or an album or something that you can, like a physical object. That's my focus as a photographer. Not all photographers do. Some photographers just like, they take pictures, you buy the files, um, or here's a disc of images, good luck. And you know, that might work, but the problem with that is you end up the disc ends up sitting in a drawer the media changes all of a sudden nobody has cd drives anymore uh even usb sticks or don't work in in new computers so digital is fine at some point but at, you need to have like that physical copy is really the best way of being able to to keep something and and keep that memory active it's also you don't remember your old dog from 20 years ago but the active memory is by looking at photos and seeing them and bringing up memories that because of those. So I think that's a big part of, of having a professional take your photos versus you know your daily stream of photos and keeping your consciousness going and, and whether it's a so, through social media or just to keep you know between friends and family, all is all that is fine, but the but that's sort of your day to day. It's sort of like enjoying a, a great meal, but the next day you're still gonna be hungry. I have 5,000 pictures of my dog sleeping in various positions. Is that all? It's the same photo <laughs> over and over again, right? It's the same thing. But as you're talking, what I'm thinking about, again, just sort of going back to how you capture some dogs that are sort of, you know, perfectly imperfect. People who have senior dogs or dogs that have, you know, missing limbs or dogs that have one eyes or dogs that may be just different from your average dog, we deserve to have good pictures of our pets just because they're missing a leg or an eye or they're old. We deserve to have good pictures of them. And although I love my 5,000 pictures of my dog sleeping in various positions, and I'm sure all of social media will too when I start posting them again, but mm -hmm. I deserve to have that nice picture of him. I want to I wanna bring up the feeling, the feeling that I have, the emotion that I have for him and that he's my family and how much I love him and the things that we do together. And whether he's perfect, to anyone else, doesn't matter. He's perfect to me. <laughs> Absolutely. And the thing when I'm photographing for somebody is I will we'll take a lot of photos, especially like a location session. We'll take a lot of photos and I'll come back and I'll edit them down to like my favorite. But I'll still have, let's say I have like three or four of pretty much the same shot where, but the head tilt's slightly different or the body position slightly different. And for me, the photographer's point of view, I'm looking at it from like composition, color, quality, focus, those kinds of things. But the owner is going to look at it from the personality and they want to see their personality dog. That's why I show them three or four or five of this, almost the same photo. So we can sort of like, oh, that's my dog's personality. And then it's like, oh yeah, that's the one that's always going to bring up that, that same emotional feelings about my dog. There has been more than a tear cried at, at, at some of my previews um, when people come and see their photos for the first time, because the, the, the emotional impact of seeing their dog in this way is just, is very powerful. So having that professional shot is, and then working with the client to make sure that I'm getting just that dog's or cat or pet's personality is really important. It was really interesting because I hadn't thought about how transient our own photographs are because of technology and changes in technology. 
you know, I've had a few professional sessions done, you know, over the years with my dogs. And, you know, for you listeners out there, if you haven't done it, it really is a stunning difference. And I would certainly encourage that. Fred, you've mentioned a couple times about, you know, if you're going on location. And can you talk to us about the difference between a studio shoot? Because I know you have your own studio and then like a natural or outdoor setting. And I suppose on location could even be within the pet's home. Right. It can be. Yes. So I do have a studio and I do do sessions there. And my studio sessions are very clean. Um, I don't use a lot of props. Um, It's usually a simple black, usually a black backdrop because that's a lot of people know me from the Black Dogs Project, which we'll probably talk about in, in a minute. And versus a location session where I usually ask, like, is there a favorite park or a favorite place that you go to? Uh, some people are like, no, they can't leave the house. We can do it in my house or in the backyard or, or something like that. Um, and so I'll work around that kind of situation based on what their needs are. Some photographers are like, I have three places. Like, I, I go to this beach or I go to this park and, and you know, that's fine. Um, I try to, if there's something special about a particular place that they go, they always go to like the Arnold Arboretum or Fells or something like that, which are two big local parks near here. There's everywhere you turn, you have a different backdrop. So you have another opportunity to change, to have a whole, totally different kind of look. So you end up f- with a lot more variety of photos at a s- location session because A, we're outdoors. We can run around maybe a little bit. I still get a lot of post shots. So I do get try to get some running shots. If the dog is, is has a good recall, I also have a, uh, like a, 20 or 30 foot long lead that we can use if they aren't so great at that, but they still want to get some running shots and I can just Photoshop out the lead. So there's always some opportunities to do something there. But yeah, you get a lot more variety of shots, the the outdoor location session, but the studio session is really clean. It's very beautiful. The lighting is very controlled. Um, you get a lot of like crisp detail on the, the, the fur and the face because it's all about like focusing on the pet and less about, you know, the dog in an environment. Right. I can imagine that, you know, it's based on preference, certainly, but that sometimes the backgrounds could be distracting in a way, you know, that it may take away from the focus on the pet. Whereas in a studio session, even though it's more, I don't want to use the word contrived, but that's all I can think of. You know, it's it's staged to a certain degree, but that focus is only on the pet. Do, do you have a preference in terms of what you prefer to do or do you leave it up to the pet owner? I really like both of them for different reasons. I love like the controlling the light, making it really clean and crisp within a studio location, but dogs like to run and play and, and be active. So if I can capture that within a uh, a location session, you know, that's great. I'm still going to get some posed and close-ups and, and things like that at a location session, but I also get the variety of being able to run around and play and do that. The most we can do in the in the studio is like jumping or, you know, playing with a ball or something like that. Or, you know, th- the throwing the treats and catching it has been very popular for the past few years online. But I'm more about just, you know, beautiful headshot, try to get them looking at the camera or a particular pose something that's that stands out um, i just had a dog in the studio this last weekend for their birthday photo so they were wearing a little crown it was it was adorable and it turned out great and i think once it's printed like on either aluminum or canvas it's going to be like an amazing showpiece for them to have in their house because it's mm-hmm. it's a studio session is a little more unique because it's it's not as common so it's going to be something that's a little more or a little less ordinary i guess and you, you mentioned the throwing the treats. Uh, I just tried that yesterday, not for a photograph, but I had my dog sitting and and I said, watch me. And I had a little treat in each hand and I tossed them. I guess I've never done this in their almost seven years. They both ran away in fright. Like they ducked. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's when you rely on the owners to know what makes their their dog tick. But but in that vein, Fred, do you have any, before we move on to your special projects, any tips or tricks to those people out there and just in terms of capturing, you know, that special photo that they might want to try on their own? You know, you mentioned treats, you mentioned a ball. Can you give us an inside scoop? Yeah, I think that the, 
if you want to get nice photos of your pet, think of think of the environment that they're in. Like if there's a weird like pole behind them and you take a picture and you're only looking at them, and all of a sudden there's a pole growing out of the pet's head, it might look a little distracting. So like maybe like move left or right so the, the pole is out of the way. Like so think about like what the backdrop is going to look like as it relates to it. Treats are great because if you and if you hold it like right over the lens or just like if you're, you're shooting with your cell phone, which is like probably 98% of people are doing, you know, hold a treat over the camera so they're looking right at the camera. And so you get a little more of their expression that way and they're a little more focused on the treat. So they're a little more, their face isn't just panting or, or indifferent. They have a little more of an expression to it. I always try to keep the camera like at nose height or maybe a little bit lower. So you're kind of not too low, but try to keep the camera low. But you can do that instead of like crouching down, just if you turn your phone over and you have the lens at the bottom of the, or heading towards the floor instead of being up, mm. um, you can still take a picture and the, the camera will automatically know that turned over and it will write itself once it's in your library of images. So you can That's take a brilliant. picture without having to bend over uh, when you're taking your photos. Yeah, a lot of people ask me about photographing black dogs especially and because it's you know it's my thing and um I, I tell people well the camera is trying to look at the whole scene and if there's a black dot in a white room it's going to make an average so that the white will become a little more gray and the black will become a little less black so you end up with mostly black with a lot of gray so if you click on the the subject of your dog when you click on the back of your screen on your phone a little square will come up and then you can adjust your exposure and you want to just to overexpose a little bit so that the the hair looks more like hair instead of just a, a black blob. So a little bit of overexposure for a, when you're photographing a dog or if you use a digital camera, you overexpose by one stop or change the EV by one EV and the photographers in the room will know say, what you're I'm talking about. You're geeking out on me, Fred. You're geeking out. And the out. rest of us are going to be like, eh, what's he talking about? <laughs> So, Fred, I think this is a perfect segue into you telling us about the Black Dogs Project, what it is, and how did it come to be? Sure, Kathy. The uh, the Black Dogs Project came to be from a just normal visit to the dog park. So, it's Sunday at 10 a.m., this park at the next town over for me, uh, there is like this unofficial official dog park time. So, everybody who has a dog has found out about it, and there's, there's a lot of dogs that come to this place. And I'm there and I'm hanging out and this woman starts talking about how black dogs have a harder time getting adopted than other dogs. And I'm, you know, there taking my pictures and listening to that. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know about that. And I'm someone who's involved in the, in the pet world, you know, in my own way as a pet photographer. And if I didn't know about it, I bet a lot of other people didn't know about it. So I'm like, well, why don't I try to take some pictures of black dogs? And I was also looking for a good studio project. I had a, I set up a small studio in the basement of my house and wanted to like get better at my studio lighting. So I ended up um, inviting some people to come to my studio and let me take pictures of their black dogs. And I set up a, a whole lighting setup that I knew would work well. And I wanted to make sure that it was a black on black. And I knew that would make the dog stand out even more instead of doing like black on white or some other color or like on location. Um, I wanted them to really stand out as the beautiful black dogs that they were. So I invited people to do that. And, and some people thought like, who's this creepy guy who wants to have me come to their basement of their house. And, but a few <laughs> people were like, Oh yeah, I'll, um, uh, I'll do that. And so this one woman came with her German shepherd who, she brought her son and my kids were there. And then my first dog, Toby, was there. And it was a crazy, crazy, crazy half an hour photo shoot. But at the end, I looked at the photos and I'm like, wow, these are amazing. I have to keep doing this. And um, I started sharing them. I put it on to a Tumblr website and put it out there in the world and just, just started posting like a picture a week. You know, I would try to get some people in and every week and I would, and I would ask all my friends and use social media and other people had started vouching for me. And uh, yeah, so we ended up taking some, some really fun photos and I started sharing them online and then it was getting a tiny bit of traction, 
but not like anything major um, until I was looking at, there was at one point there was the Huffington Post good news section. So this one woman kept posting pretty much the same pet photographer was taking these beautiful photos of, of her golden retriever. And like, so I sent her a message, a tweet and said, Hey, you know, if you really like those photos, maybe you should check out my project. And she did. And she looked it up and then we, she did this little interview and I gave her a bunch of photos and she shared them online and it ended up on Huffington Post. It was the most shared article in Huffington Post that day of all of Huffington Post. So that's a pretty big deal at that time. So yeah. Congratulations. Um, and then it went crazy from there. So. And Fred, I don't know if you said, but this was approximately when? I mean, it was very early in your your career. Yeah, it was like 2000. 14 to and the book came out in um late 15. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to emphasize the book because it was gifted to me. Uh one of the dogs that I treated for years and became very good friends with Duncan's owner. Oh, we had Duncan. Yeah, you'll you'll find Duncan in the pages of the Black Dogs Project book. Uh, his owner Chrissy gave it to me for I think Christmas, and I so I have a signed Fred Levy uh, hardcover copy, and I, I cherish it. It's on my bookshelf. I'm looking at it right now. The tagline is "Extraordinary Black Dogs and Why We Can't Forget Them." And a portion of the proceeds from the book went to a animal rescue as a, a charity, a philanthropic endeavor as well. And mm -hmm. the the pictures are stunning. You know, mutts to purebreds, but the thing they share is that they're all black. And then you ask the owners to write, what would you say, a little bio, a story about their relationship with their pet that coincides yeah. with the picture? Yes, that's, that's I think, one of the big differences between my book and some of the other pet photo books that are out there. There's some great pet photographers out there doing some beautiful books, um, but it's mostly just about the pictures. Uh, this, we, we incorporated the stories of each of the dogs and we worked with each owner to write a story. And we got these really great stories and some are, are like, will make you laugh and some will make you cry. And it's, it's a really great, deeper dive into not just like the beautiful photos, but the, the beautiful lives that these dogs have or the difficult lives that they started with and the where they ended up now or uh, the sadness that they actually might have passed away before the book even got published. So there's uh, there's some great stories in there and it's really wonderful to to, yes. to jump into to it that way. And, and, you know, there's four or five paragraphs. Some of them, I'm looking at Duncan's page and it's seven paragraphs mm -hmm. and i knew this part of the story just it evolved during my relationship with both duncan and chrissy but i'm just going to read this passage from chrissy i was still grieving the sudden loss of my father and duncan was a loving comfort to me i even named him after the navy destroyer ship my father was on during the vietnam war the uss duncan so you know that's just one small example of, of again, how much our dogs mean and. Uh... Sure. There's such an anchor of, of goodness within, you know, maybe a chaotic life that you're having at the moment where it's, it's so important that they're there to make, you know, make you feel good and make sure that, that you understand that, that even though the world might be going crazy, that, that the simple life that your dog has is like, okay, here I am with you right now. And that's all that's important. And to, to, to be able to ground yourself with the ownership of, of your pet and be able to say, okay, I am, I am here now with you and all the other distractions aren't as important it makes a big deal in people's lives. And, and Duncan was a, is a perfect example of that. And I'm glad you mentioned about the black backdrop against black dogs, because intuitively, I would think that that is just a big no-no. But you explained it beautifully and how it really makes these, the dogs themselves pop. And I also noticed that one of the, the few pictures that has the dog's tongue out is of Duncan. And I'd always heard when we started to get more aware of this black dog syndrome, where, you know, again, they're, they're the last to be 
adopted, rescued, that that's one of the things that you should do is, you know, try to get their mouth open so that you can see that contrast. It's not just a black blob, you know, maybe have them turned a little bit so you can see some of the white around their eyes and so forth. But to a professional photographer, you didn't do that. And uh, most of the dogs, I'd say 98% of them have their mouths closed. It's, it's very curious to me. Can we go back and talk a little bit more about black dog syndrome? Because I'd like to talk about a little bit, maybe of maybe some myths and misconceptions about animals that are black not getting adopted because it happens to cats too. Black cats are the least likely to get adopted in the shelter. And the ASPCA in uh, 2013, they tried to debunk the phenomenon of black dog syndrome and found that what they found was that many people perceive black dogs as, as being friendly and that maybe their bias was actually based on or, or their perception of a, of a dog's personality was based on size. But in 2014, Pet, Pet Finder conducted a large survey that found that black dogs were on the adoption list four times longer than the average dog. And I think that there may be some misconceptions about, about black dogs and black cats. Maybe people think black cats are bad luck. Maybe people think that, that black dogs are maybe bad because you've seen them portrayed in movies as the bad dog. But I'm wondering even if one of the factors in dogs not getting adopted because they're black dogs is poor pictures of black dogs where they just, you know, because you're drawn to something, right? Something draws you to that pet when you want to adopt them. And if it's not a good picture, maybe you would scroll on by. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I agree that photography can make a big difference in the adoption process. If you take a, a poor angled bad photo of a dog in, a, in its cage, like through the bars, it's not going to get adopted. Where if you take it outside and, you know, it's happy um, and maybe playing or even just sitting there looking a little more calm and, and comfortable, it's more likely to get adopted. So I think photography can make a, a big difference. And, it, and also previously, like when I was first started this project, I mean, digital photography was fully involved in, in photography at that point, but the, but the quality of sensors and the ability to get good dynamic range of, of so that you get the details in the shadow and details in the, the highlights uh, weren't as prevalent then. So you take, like I said earlier, if you take pictures of, of a dark dog or a black dog in a white room, it's going to be a black spot in a gray room. Mm -hmm. So that's never going to look great. So there's a lot of people who do go and volunteer who know how to take pictures or, or you know, they're like amateur photographers that or even professional photographers in the area that like in that area that like to take or volunteer their time to take photos for shelters and i think that's great but yes the the quality of the image will make a big difference with that when the huffington post shared the the article and then everybody was seeing it and i my email just got flooded with people responding with all kinds of um crazy stories about from things like black chihuahuas are considered you know evil in oh. certain you know areas in in central and south america to black dogs in india carry an evil spirit into a house so that or like absorb the evil spirit in a house so that you know it holds on to the evil spirit um or something along those lines i can't remember exactly the story i'm no expert in any of these things but you know these are just some of the the stories that people would send me about it I mean, I don't think there's anything more stunning than a shiny black dog that just had a bath and the coat is glimmering and they're just, they're beautiful. And then the, my second favorite, of course, is the black dog that's getting just a little bit of gray and, and peppering in their face. It's just gorgeous. And so they all have value and the color doesn't matter. <laughs> I love my Black Dogs project and I think it's important to represent that, that those dogs definitely deserve as much love as any other dog. You know, I know... Today, it's, it's challenging. Uh, we all live in New England, and many dogs come from other areas of the country. And so to be adopted, because we have a high adoption rate up here, and you don't always have that opportunity to meet the pet, you know, it is based on a picture and so forth. So I think, you know, having, you know, pictures, photos that 
capture that dog's personality that are equivalent to what the description is, you know, maybe the best that, that you can do if you don't have a chance to meet them. I just wanted to say too, that as we were talking about, I was thinking about my history with pets and my two Cavaliers who are couch potatoes that matches my personality. They're black. They're tricolor, mainly black. The first dog that I got of my own when I graduated from college and was living on my own was a black Cocker Spaniel mix. And our family has owned two black cats when I was growing up. So doing my part. Nice. <laughs> Good job, Chris. The dog that was in my studio this weekend was actually a black, uh, black, white, and brown Cavalier or King Charles oh, Cavalier. So they extra pugs pretty adorable. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. But there's, and there's a reason I, we have pugs. And there's a reason we've always had pugs because we're sitting here watching, uh, let's make a deal and price is right. And then we'll go around the block once and have lunch. You know? That's yep. it. So um, Fred, can you tell us about some of your other projects that you're involved in? I've done a few different projects uh, in between trying to just keep my business going and photographing other people's dogs. I've done some different projects. I've tried like things with service animals. Um, I photographed a few different people and who have service animals and worked with a few different groups like there's uh, needs. Um, I've gotten to photograph their dogs, which was really fun. And needs is a local but nonprofit, I believe that that trains dogs, namely labs and golden retrievers to be service dogs and put them out in the community. Right. Their focus is sort of a general service dog for, for a wide variety of, of people of different either mental or physical needs that they would need a dog for versus like there are different organizations that work with strictly like seeing eye dogs, which is a, a different personality set when it comes to uh, a service dog. Uh, there is the the Service Dogs Project, which is also a local group. They raise specifically Great Danes to be service dogs for people, um, especially people who have like physical mobility issues where they can have a nice big dog to lean against. They're great. So you've worked with all of these uh, different groups. I, I remember yeah, you I talked to me about uh, the Berkeley School of Music. Yeah, I went and photographed. Uh, there's a, a professor there who is blind. And he has a small set of, of blind musician students that he works with on a regular basis. And I got to go and meet him. He's super nice. Uh, and his dogs and, and I got to photograph them at Berkeley. So my current project that I'm literally just getting off the ground, I'm still building the, the backdrop for it at the moment. So this is extremely new. You are like hot off the presses. First person to even hear about this. So you heard it on petability first. You absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, he 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 gave me some insights last week when we talked by phone. And I'm super excited about this. And I know you will be Kathy, and so will our audience. So do tell Fred. Well, my hope is that I'm gonna build this backdrop where it has these different colors, projected lights onto a onto a scrim that will give this particular look that I'm I'm hoping will make the dog stand out. Uh, I've been inspired by a lot of other uh, photographers and the work that they're doing to try to make something more unique. And I really want to photograph tripods, not Yay! just because because they are, uh, I yes. mean, they're great. And many dogs end up being tripods for any number of reasons. It could be something like physical accident that happened to, you know, fighting cancer. But And they usually live very good, comfortable lives uh, as, if if this will resolve their issue. Um, because most dogs can do, be fine with on, on three legs, but they, they definitely need a little more care. And some people might like not want to deal with that, which is fine, but there's plenty of people that do. And I really appreciate those people. And, and I think of them as a sort of the, the poster children of all pets that, that have special needs. I just photographed another client recently who just adopted a new dog that is, can't, control its valve movement. It has no like muscle control there. So it has to wear a diaper all the time. Fred, tell us how that happened. You said that they were, they just happened upon this dog. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy story. They were not planning on adopting this dog. There were any dog. They, they have a dog right now, which was actually fighting cancer at the point at that time. And then actually passed away a week after the 
photo session that I just did with them. But that's another story. Anyway, the this dog, the woman went with um, a friend to, I think, Tufts. Um, she was there mostly for moral support. And this other family was there with this this little dog that they just found out that they got from, from a breeder that was pooping everywhere and they couldn't control it and it didn't recognize it. And they found it, well, it just, it can't. It's just, it's, it will always have this problem. It will be like this for its whole life. And that this was like a family, probably their first dog as a family and they wanted something and the kids were crying. And the, the but my client reached out to the nurse later and said, you know, if they don't have a place for this dog, we would be happy to adopt it. So that's what they did. They ended up with this dog, but they had no idea or even interest in getting at that point. But when they saw it, it's like, oh, it's just a happy little puppy that just needs right. a good home. And, you know, so the point that, you know, Kathy was making in the beginning of our, of our recording today is that, you know, there, just because a dog is different and maybe imperfect in someone's eyes, they may be perfect for you. They're still a perfect dog and can be a great companion. And I know, Fred, that you shared when you did the studio shoot with this particular dog that there were three diaper changes, but you you got through it. And so I just I just wanted you know you to mention that little aside because I again I think it speaks to your willingness to work with people and your passion and and the kinds of dogs that you photograph. One thing that you mentioned to me that I never thought about as you're embarking on this new project with three-legged pets is that that is something that is instantly relatable and visually obvious. Whereas like this little dog that is incontinent, through a photograph, you wouldn't be able to see that necessarily. A lot yeah. of the aging dogs, you know, they may have you know, arthritis, you can't see arthritis, but it was an aha moment for me when you said why you wanted to photograph, because it's a visual medium, the tripod dogs. And I think that that's, that's amazing. We need to introduce him to Jim and Renee uh, Agredano at Tripods. If you want to be more, if you want, if anybody wants to be inspired, they should go and listen to the episode that we did with them about uh, three-legged dogs. It's a huge community. It uh, really is. Internationally. I mean, they're based in the United States, but they have their own story and how they got into it and so forth. But just a plethora of resources. I would I would love to meet them. That's that would be great. And if anybody has a tripod that's in the, you know, the Boston area that would like to help me test out because this project, because I'm still in like building the set stage, you know, please reach out and I'm happy to, to work with you to get some nice photos. So as we're cl closing up here, I'm wondering, Fred, can you tell us a story of one of your favorite photo shoots? So I, I love working with my clients because my clients, if they're, if they're coming to me, they love their pets, right? They're not, they're not coming to me because it's like, oh yeah, it's like, I'll just do it on a whim. Uh, no, they're coming to me because they love their pets and they really want, and they love photography and they love beautiful imagery and they've seen my work and they love it. Uh, I have one client that I've gotten to photograph quite a bit. They have, they have large dogs. They have, they usually have Great Danes or Irish Wolfhounds and they have four or five of them at a time. And I've been photographing them for, gosh, probably six or more years at this point. Time is a funny thing. Yeah. I, they they are definitely one of my earlier clients, and they've been sticking with me, letting me photograph their family and their dogs. They have one young daughter, and then they have four or five dogs at any given time. And the last time we did a location session with them, it was really funny because we they have what do they have three Great Danes and two Irish Wolfhounds at that time, and we've we had them all them all sitting or laying on the ground with a, like a nice sort of tree line backdrop in, in the fall. So, you know, nice colors and everything. And then, and one of the Great Danes is deaf, of course, because a big white Great Dane is probably going to be deaf. And then uh, the daughter is sitting there like in the middle of all of them too. And they're all sort of in a row. And I'm like doing everything I can to kind of get their attention and get them all to look. And my assistant is coming behind me with my rolly case and she's 
dragging because we had the lights set up and we had the thing even on location session i always bring lights so she's rolling the case and all the dogs just stop and they all look up just over me because i'm laying flat on the ground and to to see her and what she's doing and everybody is looking so i have five dogs and the girl which was actually <laughs> one of the more difficult parts of that was uh all looking and we got this beautiful photo and uh it's on my website and i i have a big canvas print of it in my studio because i love it so much i saw that and, photo on your website it is it is breathtaking yeah to get all those dogs to to sit and and look up and that's the one that, that when people ask it's like how do you get them to look and then they see that and they're like how did that happen <laughs> you know that's the one that's like how'd you get them all to look the most i've had to do was was eight eight dogs at once i got them all to look but that was like i had i think six people all like trying to get their attention right behind me um but their that family is has been wonderful and i love photographing their, their dogs i'm actually in the middle of they just actually adopted another white deaf great dane and i've been photographing that dog since it was 15 weeks and so we've got like little and then bigger than big Aww. than big than giant and um <laughs> and i hope these people uh, have a big house <laughs> uh, they put an extra roof uh, an extra floor on their house well i was just gonna say you know i have heard because i'm i'm a little bit of a movie buff and you know working with animals um when you know you're in the the biz and children is the most challenging so the fact that that you chose to to do this i think is is wonderful and as we close, I also want to challenge our listeners to try to check your perhaps implicit bias again against uh, dogs that may be different, you know, whether they have one eye, you know, are deaf, uh, three legs, or black. So, you know, really think about, you know, what makes you tick and, and where your judgments might lie and, and see if you can uh, recognize that and maybe turn that around. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. the The core of 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 pretty much any creature is is their personality, and and as humans, we like to like Im, like apply our own humanity onto these creatures, um, whatever it is. And um, I think that that dogs and cats and and certain other animals are willing to put up with us is awesome, and we should really appreciate that and enjoy that that we get to enjoy their company. So I find that's very important. Well, and one of the reasons that we have pets is we always talk about that unconditional love, right? That they don't judge, that they're always there for us, and we need to to do the same for them. Exactly. So, Fred, where is your studio, and how can people find you? How can they contact you? Uh, my studio is in Littleton, Mass., right off of 495. Um, you can find me on my website, fredlevyart.com. Uh, you can find any find me on any social media for the most part at at Fred Levy Art. Um, I find that's just works as a good handle. And uh, reach out. Um, there's a form to fill out on my website. If you use that to, to to contact me, that's usually the best way. And then we can start a, a phone conversation um, about it because I I always love talking to people about their pets. Mm -hmm. Us too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank it's you. Fred. Nice, right? Yep. Yes, thank you, Fred. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kathy and Chris. I, it, it's been an honor to be on your show. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on social media at Petability Podcast. And please check out our affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Thank you and tune in next time.